Well, I want to thank everyone for coming this morning. Um, I just a couple minutes ago met with um, Don Horner, the chair of the Heart Board, and I have accepted his resignation as the chairman and as a member of the Heart Board, effective immediately. And I want to thank Don Horner for his years of, of hard work on behalf of our rail project and serving on the Heart Board. As you know, he was appointed when the board was put together after a charter amendment that was passed in 2010, and he served and worked very hard ever since then. And my next job as mayor is to find an appointment to replace Don Horner. As you know, he was my appointee, and we're beginning the search of finding someone um, who's going to step up and, and do the heavy lifting and hard work that needs to be done moving forward on a rail project. For me, it's about looking forward. I'm still 100% committed to this project. It's absolutely worth fighting for. Um, there is no other mode of transportation being designed to address the traffic problems on the west side, and particularly, and through the urban core also, other than, than rail. And so, yes, we'll have problems in the future. We're going to have more hurdles to, to jump over, and mountains to climb. Uh, but every one of those efforts is worth it because of the significant impact this project's going to have on the people of this island, not just today, but we're talking 50 years from now, too. Um, with that, um, I'll open it up to any questions you may have. We do have Colleen Hanabusa and Mike Formby, both members of the board. Both uh, Colleen is my appointee. Mike is on the board because of the Director of Transportation Services. But they stand here today partly because they're folks that I look to to ask the hard questions, to do the heavy lifting, to turn over every stone, to make sure that every fact is, is, is reviewed as we move forward with this project. Did you ask him to resign? I accepted his resignation this morning. I had set up a meeting before I left for a family vacation to talk to him about some of the problems and issues that we're facing, and he tendered his resignation at the beginning of the meeting. But were you planning to ask for his resignation had he not turned one in? I would have. I was going to reach out to him and ask that, yes, he tender his resignation. And why did you feel that he needed to step down? I think that at this point we need a new direction, a different form of leadership. For me, I just want to make absolutely certain that there's confidence in this project. Um, and I see an erosion of confidence in this project, both by my administration, by the city council, as you've heard, and by the public at large. And I think we have to rebuild that confidence. And I think a change in, in heart leadership, particularly as the chair of the board, is a, is a step in that direction. Mayor, at what point did you decide that you were going to ask Mr. Horn for his I think it's been part of an evolving process over the past couple of months. Um, um, it, 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 at the end of the day, it boiled down to the issue for me of, of the cap versus no cap. As you know, I did not support a cap um, that was passed in Bill 23. I believe the cap is the five years. I said that repeatedly. Others felt that there, there could be a cap put in place. Uh, for me, I bottom line for me is I, I want realistic numbers, not sure-coded numbers. And that means let's talk about if there are, if it's going to be higher, let's talk about it being higher. Um, this thing of trying to shape it as close as possible and then saying you need more money erodes confidence, as I mentioned, with everyone. And one thing we need to do is keep the confidence of the people of this island and of the council and of the administration, but also the legislature too. And so that was part of the reason that I started to consider it. And ask for his resignation. How confident are you at this point that the five-year extension is going to generate the money needed to complete it to all in one? You know, it's a hard question to answer. As, as you've heard me say before, Marcel, it's what are the next two bids look like? And we know there's a, the first, there's 10 miles out right now. The first five of the 10 will be open probably sometime in the beginning of this summer. I'm holding my breath. I am concerned to tell you, is five years enough? I surely hope so but we're not going to know. We have not put out a bid for an elevated part of this project since 2010. That's six years ago, and as we know, the construction costs have only climbed tremendously in this state and on this island in particular. It's top now. It's not even close. It's above New York, above L.A. So I'm, I am concerned. I'm holding my breath. We'll have to see. But we have five years um, additional money, and I'm absolutely, I want to make it clear, against raising real property taxes to help pay for this project or using real property taxes to pay for this project. We have two sources under law, and those are two sources we need to look at, too. One is federal funding under the full funding grant agreement, which is about $1.55 billion in the money generated from the GET, which we now have going on until 2027. 
Can you expand a little more when you say sugar coated numbers? At what can you can you get into a little more detail about what you think was sugar coated and at what well, point? Again, as as I look back at, at, at when we were at before the legislature, before he we went, um, I felt based on my calculations that we'd need about one point two billion more based on the percentage increase on the nine station bid. Uh, Hart felt that 910 million was sufficient. Um, when I asked him why that number and not my number, they said we're going to do value engineering. Uh, they're going to break the bids into smaller components, which has worked. We've seen bidding coming in a little lower, at, or at least on target in terms of their anticipated budget. But for me, I think to try to shave it as close as you can, knowing that in projects like this, massive construction projects, the biggest construction project in the history of this place, that it's probably going to cost more, not less. And by talking about the higher numbers and not the lower numbers, I think builds trust with the public to understand, yes, there are huge challenges. And so it's easier to accept 910 million than 1.2, right? That's a billion, more than a billion dollars. For me, I think in the future, and something I've learned, and that's why I said no cap, the cap is five years, is that it's going to cost more money, not less. My job as mayor is to push the heart board as hard as I can to control those costs. But at the end of the day, the costs are the cost. Um, and I just think it's better to talk about the high end and not the low end. So at the end of the day, it seems like you think it was wrong to, for hard officials to settle on that cap during the negotiations of Bill 23. I would have, as I said, I, I just know what I, I said. The Hart Board is, is, is um, they're tasked with building the project, but I believe as mayor um, that the cap was five years. The legislature made a cap of five years. As you recall, I asked for in perpetuity. I asked for 25 years, and I asked for 10 years. We got five. I wanted more money, one, because I want to continue to build the system to other parts of this island and use this GET tax, by the way, which is one-third, despite what other people say, paid for by visitors and the military, offshore folks, to continue to operate and maintain the system. We didn't get that. I do believe someday this is going to become uh, a, a, something to consider. But as you know, I wanted more money because I believe that in most likely we're going to need more money to build this system. Dan, go ahead. Yeah, where does this leave uh, Dan Grabowskis at this point? You know, that's, that's something, and that's why I have the two members of the Hart Board here today. As you know, the people of the city and county of Honolulu under a charter amendment in 2010 spoke. They said, we do not want politics to be directly involved in the building of the project. And so they created this board who's tasked with building the project. The board is the one who hires or fires the executive director. Um, I appoint three members. The council appoints three members. Uh, a member of our, my staff, Mike Formby, is on it. I don't appoint him, but whoever the director of transportation services is on it. The state director of transportation is on it, Ford, Fujigami. And then they pick, all those board members pick another board member. So I believe, and the people have spoken, I'm going to honor what the people have said, that is the heart board that needs to make a decision regarding the executive director. As you know, right now, he, he's being evaluated as we speak. I don't know when the evaluation is going to be completed, um, but I want to allow that evaluation to go forward. I think it's their determination to decide what to do with the executive director. I do ask this. Just so I'm going to be looking in the new heart board member that I select that this person believe 100% in openness and transparency, number one. Number two, that accurate numbers are given at all times, not those sugar-coated or underreported type numbers. Those two things are critical. And the last one is that when numbers are given, that there's some consistency so that if they do go up, there's an explanation as to why they go up and that it's given in, in real time as these numbers become available. So for example, at the legislature, when I worked so hard for this five-year extension or more, which started in January, ended in May, shortly thereafter we were told more money would be needed. I was told more money would be needed. I question what changed during that period of time. If things changed, those numbers should be given in real time to the people of this island, reported to you and then given to the people of this island. Um, with the cap, I believed we probably would need all of it. There was a decision made. What changed? Because after that, it was told that we probably need more than what the cap was. This is what I mean in the third point, that consistent numbers are given, and if there's a reason for change, that they're reported immediately and explained as to why. Does Mayor Hunter really, um, really believe this resignation will help, or is it just to show that something's being done? 
you know, it, it, he's my appointee. He recognizes um, that the buck stops with him. And um, before I left, I asked for this meeting um, to, that we had today. And I think he's, he's moving on. I think it's, do the problems go away? Absolutely not. Um, as I mentioned, that this is the largest construction project in the history of this place. It's going through the most dense part of our city. There are numerous complications they're going to face. The utility issue, as you saw, was discussed, um, is one of those that we're going to continue to have problems. So those problems don't go away, but it's how we talk about them. It's how we deal with them. Um, it, and I have to say, I like how Colleen Hanabusa talks about it. I like how Mike Formby talks about it. I think with Colleen coming on the board, in fact, working with Mike, you see the board meetings take longer. I'm not looking for longer meetings, but they're taking longer because hard questions are being asked. And when answers aren't provided, decisions aren't made until those answers are provided. I think, one, that gives great confidence to me as mayor. And I'm sure that everyone watching the news that you report also gets confidence from that because they know that, yes, there are hard, answer, hard questions, but we need the answers before decisions are made. And I want more of that to occur in the future. And I think this is a strong message uh, to the board and to whoever I select. It's going to be a strong message to whoever I select that number one, first and foremost, is openness and transparency in reporting of real numbers, not ones that are easy to swallow. If they're hard to swallow, they're reported. And finally, if those numbers change, that they're reported quickly as to why and not held back until after a bill passes. What do you, you think? I know you said that it wasn't your decision about Grabowskis, but can you least share with us your thoughts and opinions on the type of job he's been doing? You know, that. I look at where we are with the project today, and we're going to be probably having a press conference in early May, you know, because the maintenance facility is going to be completed. 41 acres of, of a project with rail yard and, and you know, bus uh, uh, barns for the, for the rail cars. We have almost seven miles of elevated guideway built. We have the first cars coming. There's a lot of good news here. But for me, the one thing that I struggle with is the communication of the difficult problems, particularly financial ones and schedule also, um, that I think a better job needs to be done with this administration, with the city council, and with the public. And that is something I think that needs to be looked at long and hard by the heart board of whoever the executive director is, and a clear message sent that these things need to change. You think Grabowskis needs to do a better job of communicating? I think so. Why is he not here? He's, he's the executive director. These are my appointees, and of course, Don Horner is my appointee. You're going to need to go talk to him as to questions you may have for him. Did you have these concerns uh, two weeks ago when we had a news conference when the rail cars uh, arrived at Honolulu Harbor? I did. And also when we had the groundbreaking out at, um, out at uh, in, uh, West Lock, I mean West Lock, UH West Oahu. Did you give either uh, of the two any indication about your reservations? I have been giving indications to, to both the chair of the board and to Dan Grabowskis, my concerns about increases in cost and how they're reported. And what do you say to folks who might think that uh, Don Horner's just being made a scapegoat uh, at this point? You know, I think Don Horner saw the problems that were created by talking about a cap and then quickly saying, we can't live with that cap. And he worked hard on that with the council. And I think you saw the anger that came from the council when they started to realize that should, soon after, because I mean, the, I signed the bill into law, what, a month ago? That perhaps the numbers in that cap weren't sufficient. And I think he recognized his responsibility and stepped up and did a difficult, made a difficult decision, but made a decision I think he thought he needed to make. Council Chair, but you um, should ask him, you know, talk to him too. Council Chair Martin, um, said that he thought there was a change of leadership needed uh, as chair, but he thought that perhaps Don Horner could remain on the board. Were you willing to allow that? You know, I, I, I don't, I, you know, I'm not going to speculate to what the chair meant or said, or, but I, I, I accepted his resignation from the board. It's something that I expected and I don't regret. And Horner's letter specifically uh, points out uh, that certain things were brought out that were not made public, I guess, that were tied to the audit. Uh, I don't know. I guess a number of board members uh, met with Council Chair Martin, and uh, he was under the impression that you were not aware of some of these. Could we get either of you two to talk about I don't know about? if you want to address that, but I'm willing to. Yeah. The audit still isn't complete, as you know. It hasn't become public. So it's really not something that 
I personally have any great knowledge about. I don't know what form it's going to take and what it's going to say. My understanding is the way audits are done for the city is not the same as the state. So when Marion Higa, for example, did audits, she gave her report and each of the relevant departments, in HART, uh, DTS, whoever would be considered an interested party, would then provide feedback. And usually that's just attached and they would respond. So I'm not quite sure how this audit is going to work or what is it that the, that the chair has seen versus what uh, I, I assume, I assume maybe uh, Mike has seen it but I, I don't know who else has seen it. Mike, you want to add anything to that? Well, I've seen a confidential draft, but it was Mike, just Mike, come that, stand over here. Yeah, it was, it was confidential, and so I'm not really in a position to talk about it until it comes out, because they do change between the draft and the final. So I haven't seen the final yet. Do you, do you think it's prudent to go through this exercise prior to that audit coming out? This exercise? I mean, as far as, as Forner giving in his resignation, I mean, well, should we have waited to see what that that audit said publicly. Okay, so I don't think that's really a question for me as a board member, but I'll tell you, um, Chair Horner submitted his resignation. No, he offered it to the mayor. So I don't, I don't know that it's a question to ask whether or not it's appropriate. He submitted his resignation, which means he felt it was appropriate to do that to the mayor. Maybe to the mayor. Do you think it was appropriate to accept his resignation prior to getting that? My, my accepting of his resignation was not dependent on this audit. Um, it, was depend it was dependent on, on, on other issues dealing with the, the council on the cap and in previous requests. It, it pertains to basically money and schedule and disclosing increases earlier and being fully open and transparent. So the audit would not have affected my acceptance. Did, did Chair Martin's letter from last week uh, to, uh, to Hart, or I think it was actually to you, right, to, uh, to join in, in asking for his resignation, did that have anything to do with your decision today? Um, absolutely not. Uh, as I mentioned, I was on a family vacation before I left. I asked Mike, uh, Colleen, to talk to the chair about what I was looking at, what I was hearing, and the request that we go together on making a decision. Um, unfortunately, that didn't occur. I was in the air when the letter was given to me. When I landed, I found out about it. But we'd already set up the meeting with, with Don Horner before I left, and we agreed, and he agreed to come in. and. I did what we were planning to do before I left. And at that point, I would have liked to have had the chair sitting there with me. But he made his views known. And you know, we're, we're aligned on this issue, by the way. Mayor, do you still regularly meet with Dan Grabowskis every week on the project? I, ha I have met with Dan Grabowskis every week, usually Thursdays, except very recently. I canceled several of the meetings, uh, partly because of the difficulty I was having. I did have a meeting before I left on vacation because I just wanted to touch base on some of the issues, cars coming, those kind of things. Um, but I have to say the relationship has not as, not as uh, what do you want to call it, Mike? I just didn't think it was, sitting down and talking about the things we talked about weren't sufficient, that things needed to change, that we needed to get real about numbers, and we need to talk about it publicly. So Can I ask uh, uh, both of the directors here, mm -hmm. at any time did you feel you were in the dark about uh, what was transpiring with the project and the costs that were escalating? If you watched us, <laughs> you would find out that, yes, we had many issues. Well, I personally had many issues about it, and that's why there have been votes where we did not approve, for example, change orders and so forth until we got the sufficient information. We've also made uh, a request for example, and we hope that it's going to be addressed in the upcoming meeting about the whole transaction between Ansaldo and Hitachi. Mm -hmm. Like, who is the joint venture right now? Who, who is that? You know, there, it's the biggest, that's the most expensive part in the long run for the people because that's the operational cost. So who is the Ansaldo Hawaii JV? We know that uh, Hitachi bought Ansaldo Brita, but the question is, who has Ansaldo STS? So those are the kinds of issues. Like, for example, do we have a right to consent? And I'm not saying anything that you can't find in the minutes, because most of the information I get is in the actual board meeting. So the frustration that I have felt with not having things said to me, for example, undergrounding of utility lines have been a major issue for me. I mean, I, mean, I just did not believe that we didn't have the amount of money allocated that I thought we needed. And I was told early on, and Mike can confirm this, that it wasn't an issue. And it didn't become an issue till the ending of last year and the beginning of this year. 
So why is that all happening? So there is a level of frustration. Uh, Michael Formby and I um, invited ourselves, sort of, to mm -hmm. the PMOC meetings because that has, we were told it wasn't made available to members. But as you know, because of this nice state law on sunshine, <laughs> and I kind of giggle because as you know, I was there, uh, I can't, we, more than two of us can't appear anywhere. So if, if there's two of us, that's it. That's all of us who can go. But we made the effort to sit through the PMOC because the PMOC information, I will tell you, is a bit different from what we get because you're talking to the federal government, you're talking to the independent, quote, contractor who's doing the project oversight. And in one of our heart board meetings, I told my colleagues, please avail yourself of this to understand what it is that is really being said. So yes, a long answer to your short question, yes. It is frustrating, but I think it's, it's a matter of, um, you know, whether or not somebody's out there to hide the ball from us or, or not. I, I don't know. Or whether they think that it's too premature for us to have that information. Mike, you Yeah, know. and I'll add to that. I'll share, I'll share frustration being on the board. Uh, we had to take steps that we felt were necessary to get information that the two of us would like to have seen presented to the board. And we always made it clear that we didn't have to talk about numbers. So if there were numbers that were procurement sensitive, that we needed not discuss in the public because we had bids on the street. We didn't want to talk about numbers. But what we wanted to talk about was issues. We wanted to talk about undergrounding on Dillingham. We wanted to talk about distances between utilities on the west side and the guideway, which has already been built. So it was really about when are we going to have very serious, discerning discussions at the board level that allow us, the council, and the public to see how complex this project is. And two board members on their own should not have to go and dig and dig and dig to get information made public. And I think that's the change that the mayor stands for today and the council chair has spoken about is it's a different way of doing business. It's about putting everything on the table, talking about it at a level that everybody understands. This project is very complex and we all need to get together and be on the same team to get it done. So do you agree with the mayor's opinions about how Dan Grabowskis is doing and how he needs to improve? Well, I would like to save that because we're board members and we need to do that in a board setting. We shouldn't be speaking publicly independently. Isn't he the real problem, though? Do we still have confidence in him? I don't, I don't think that, I wouldn't even respond to the question that way because that, it's just, it's, it's really not a fair way to address the issue. It's a very serious issue that the board needs to get together and in a board setting, have frank discussions between ourselves and then we'll decide whether or not he's met his performance criteria, but I wouldn't address it that way. Question yeah, yeah, uh, uh, Mike, Mike or, or Congresswoman, uh, the most, would you say the most sobering things, and I know at whatever level of detail you can go into, you guys, it, it sounds like you're saying you took it upon yourselves to go to these PMOC meetings and you had some very sobering reactions to it. Is it generally the utility issues? Can you, can you expand a little further on what was most disturbing or sobering or, or whatever? Well, let me, let just, me just add something and then I'll let the Congresswoman talk about utilities because she knows a lot more about that than I do. But for me, as Transportation Director, um, the Pearl Highlands parking garage, the transit center and the off-ramp is key to a functional system. And when that procurement was canceled in July of 2015 without coming to the board for a discussion or a vote that had an impact on the functionality of this system, particularly an interim opening, if there's going to be an interim opening. That community that would come down from Central Oahu will not be able to use phase one of the rail system. So those are the types of, of issues that are determined sometimes outside the board that I believe should come to the board for a full discussion. I think the public had a right to know that we were talking about that. And instead, it was a decision made unilaterally by the CEO, and then we found out about it later in hindsight. I don't think that's right. Why did we have to wait? wait, wait just call in. You want it? it? A lot of it had to do with utilities, but a lot of it has to do with just the structure. In other words, what is HART? What does HART have approval rights? And what was anticipated by the people of the city and county of Honolulu when they created HART? The board itself. The board, in my opinion, the board should be the one consenting. But the Hart administration, to a certain extent, decides what needs our consent as a board and what doesn't. That's why you saw us in one recent meeting where we said that before the uh, executive director and the chair could speak for Hart, you know, I, I hear a lot of you saying, well, Hart's position was this. We made it very clear. It had to come to the board. 
So the board is the board, and the board speaks for Hart. So if you're going to say it's Hart's position, you should have the board's approval, that we buy into it, and we live with it. But the problem, I think, up until now has been that the board doesn't really buy into it. We're beginning to do it recently, but that's because we passed a resolution to that effect. So it is a lot of different things, because what we don't want to see is, is the people think that you have all these 10 people sitting there, and what are they doing? Because we take very seriously our responsibilities. So we want, if we're going to live by the, a bad decision in the public's mind, let it be our decision. Um, you know, Werner is a well-respected businessman. Yes. Um, is there anything that will be uh, missed, or what did he bring to the board that will be hard to replace, or was he just kind of sacrificed um, for politics? I, I think, you know, Don Horner is, is an incredibly good banker. And sometimes I wonder, in terms of shaving numbers close, I think that's part of his background, right? Bankers are about lending money, and they don't want to lend any more than absolutely necessary. So if they can get the number down to as skinny as possible, um, that's a good thing. But no one has ever lent money for a project like this. I mean, this project is unique in all of the state and the history of this place. And I think that his skills as a banker in some ways maybe have, could have impacted how he looked at the numbers for rail. I'm not sure. But, you know, I have the deepest respect for Don Horner. As a lawyer, I worked, I did a lot of work for First Wine Bank when he was the, the president and CEO. Um, and he did it. He took the bank to a new level after Walter Dodds. Um, and he's an important citizen of, of this community. He's involved in a lot of different organizations. And I look to, to him to do a lot of good things for our community in the future. And I consider him a, a friend. We both shook and hugged each other at the end of our meeting. And um, we both agreed we're, we're friends. Do you think we yeah. need someone with uh, more construction background, either on the board or uh, to replace Grabowski? I am looking for someone who is a little bit more like Colleen and Mike in terms of asking the hard questions and, and really making sure that there's openness and transparency and that number, real numbers are reported, um, accurate numbers, not sure coded. And for me, yes, it could be someone who knows about money, it could be someone who knows about construction. Um, it, it, I don't think there's a perfect person, but I think it's, it's the type of approach they take to the job that makes the big difference. These two folks here have that approach, the approach that I'm looking for.